now, you know, an amazing, amazing, beautiful hospital uh, that gives such phenomenal care to our cancer patients due to, you know, just, you, you just, you just have to meet the staff at the James and uh, the leaders and, and you know you're in the right place as a patient. This is the James Cancer Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and today my guest is Mike Calagiri, the former director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center and former CEO of the James. This is our second special episode celebrating the 30th anniversary of the James. In episode one, Dave Schuler, the first head of the James and also the director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center at the time was our guest, and Dave filled us in on the early history of the James. Mike Calagiri came here in 1997, the protege of Clara Bloomfield, who Dave Schuler recruited to run the Cancer Center. Sadly, Clara passed away on March 1st, leaving behind an incredible legacy that Mike will fill us in on. We'll also talk about how Mike took the baton from Clara in 2003 and continued to build the Comprehensive Cancer Center, then took over for the retiring Dave Schuler in 2008 to lead the James. Mike soon after decided it was time to build a $1.1 billion state-of-the-art and incredible new James Cancer Hospital right in the middle of a great recession. He also came up with the idea for Pelotonia, which has raised more than $200 million for cancer research. And then he steered the Comprehensive Cancer Center to a perfect score from the National Cancer Institute, a very rare feat that's a tribute to the work of Dave Schuler, Clara Bloomfield, Mike, and the hundreds of dedicated people they recruited and led. Mike is a physician and scientist, and he's one of the world's leading experts on leukemia, lymphoma, and blood cancers. Okay, Mike, that was one of the longest introductions I've ever done on this podcast, but welcome. It's great to talk to you. Thank you, Steve. I'd asked my father to shorten the introduction, but I guess he had to get it all in there, huh? I did not get the email from him. Sorry. It must be <laughs> long. So, okay. Thank you for your kind words. And thanks for joining us on this special sort of celebration of the 30th anniversary. And sadly, we're going to have to start off on a very, very sad note for everyone, and especially for you, and that's the death of Clara, Clara Bloomfield. So, but what better way to pay tribute to her than to have you talk about her? So tell us about meeting her, which I think the first time you met her was back in 1989, and then how she and you came here to Columbus in 1997. Well, uh, anybody who's met Clara remembers meeting Clara. She was that kind of a person. She was such an incredible force at a time when there were very few women who were forces in academic medicine. She was certainly at the top of that list, um, really a world leader in leukemia at a very, very early age. She figured out uh, how to do precision medicine 50 years ago. Uh, before uh, it was even in the consciousness of most researchers. She first used chromosomes and their changes to predict outcome, the same way today we're using the DNA and genomics to predict outcome. So she was way ahead of her time and everyone else's time back then. And she had an amazing reputation. And I was flattered when I was called, uh, I mean, just joined the faculty at the Dana-Farber after training there and uh, realizing that uh, it wasn't going to be a permanent home for me. I was flattered when I was called by Clara to come and have an interview at uh, Roswell Park Cancer Institute, where she had just become the head of medicine there, the head of medical oncology. And, um, you know, I knew her by reputation, but of course, in 1989, there was no internet, there was no Google. I didn't know what Clara looked like and what kind of an imposing person she would be in person giving her formidable reputation as a scientist. And I met her in a group of about 19 or 20 people at a dinner, and I just walked into the dinner, and I wasn't sure which person it was, was Clara. And a rather short woman uh, with very wild hair walked up to me and stuck her hand out, looked up at me and said, hi, I'm Clara Bloomfield. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I'll never forget it, you know. And as, as, I, as I wrote in a recent remembrance of her, you meet Clara, you never forget meeting her. That's the type of person she was. I was very fortunate that I was their first recruit from outside uh, that, that um, came, and uh, she put me in charge of a lot of things, and I enjoyed the responsibility. I worked incredibly hard for her, 
quick little story is that when my uh, when I got to Roswell Park and I moved there, uh, my wife and I and our, our, we had one child and one born shortly thereafter, and another one born shortly after that. But um, we were down at my wife's um, home in Puerto Rico, and my father-in-law said, I, he was a very nice man, and he never gave me much advice, but he said, you know, I'll give you one bit of advice. He was a banker, and he said, it's important to get to work before your boss and to leave after your boss. You know, it a, creates a really good impression. And I said, Poppy, I got to tell you, she gets to work at 4 a.m. and leaves for home at 8 p.m., Monday through Saturday. So, uh, you know, he quickly retreated after making that declarative statement. And, uh, you know, one thing about Clara is... You didn't even try to beat her in or stay longer? Never (laughs) once. I mean, you know, that wasn't in the cards. And, you know, it wasn't her expectation, in fairness. She just wanted you to work hard and pursue academic excellence in research and clinical medicine. And most people don't know this um, about Clara, but she was as good or better a clinician than she was a scientist. She was an amazing scientist, National Academy of Medicine, you know, one of the world's best. But she was also an outstanding clinician, and everywhere she went, she elevated the level of clinical care for cancer patients by her, you know, obsessive nature with the care of each and every patient. That care of each and every patient, I've read about and heard about that, that she would spend an incredible amount of time with each patient. She would, if we had a service of 15 patients, and I'm not exaggerating, she would round 10 hours a day, meaning on those 15 patients. You know, most of us as attending physicians on that many patients would round three hours. So think of it. She went three and a half times that amount of time every single day, seven days a week for a month in a row. And by the time she left that service, that service's care had elevated you know, the nursing, the pharmacists, the social workers, everyone around her, of course, the residents and the fellows would go to a bigger, would go to a higher level of care due to her, the shadow that she cast as an outstanding clinician. How rare was that at that time for a woman to be uh, a scientist, but even more so to be in charge of a, of a comprehensive cancer center at Roswell? Well, she, she was in charge of the division I'm sorry, the Department of Medicine there. She wasn't in charge of the cancer okay. center. Roswell itself is a cancer center. The CEO is the cancer center director there by nature. But she was, as far as I know, it couldn't have been more, more than one of four or five uh, female chairs of medicine in the United States. So very, very rare. And in, and in her circles of cancer, extremely rare. And to be of that quality uh, that you saw where she had you know, just outstanding academic credentials, outstanding clinical expertise. It was unheard of. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate to come under her, her mentorship. Uh, she was just an amazing mentor. You know, for Clara, everything was academic medicine. She had no children, never had children. It was focused, uh, nor did her beloved husband, Albert. You know, their entire focus was on, um, you know, contributing to science, contributing to clinical medicine. Uh, through discovery and care. So um, it's amazing. Somebody like me walking into that situation and coming under her mentorship was a, was a dream come true. And then the next big step forward here was the recruitment of Clara, you and her husband, Albert de la Chapelle, who was also a, a world-renowned scientist. And from what I understand, he helped uh, identify the Lynch syndrome uh, genetic mutation but the recruitment of you three here in, was it 1997? Yes. That was a big step for the James and for the Comprehensive Cancer Center. So how did that come about and what brought the three of you here? What happened was that, um, let me say that if it wasn't for Dave Schuler and all that he did in the years that he was in charge of the James and the Cancer Center, we would have never been uh, moving to Ohio State. Dave had, you know, taken the new James at its birth. He was the first ever CEO of the James. So it was only seven years old when we got there. And he took over the cancer center as well and was a full-time uh, academic surgeon, very busy and outstanding clinician, head and neck cancer surgery. He worked incredibly hard to raise money uh, for the James from the Columbus community to recruit largely Albert de la Chapelle. Um, and Clara, uh, and then me. Uh, but the, the first and foremost recruit came 
when Dave consulted uh, with Bert Vogelstein, famous geneticist at Johns Hopkins, uh, on where should we go in, in creating a new James, uh, an, an image for the, new, for the new James. And Bert advised him to go into cancer genetics, which at the time was, you know, not just barely on the, you know, we didn't, sequencing wasn't all that common and genetics and cancer, the marriage was just starting. And Dave followed his advice and he raised about $50 million. Now $50 million from 90 to 97, that's a lot of money for a community that doesn't yet have a formidable cancer hospital. It's in its infancy in our cancer center. So Dave was just masterful. So they worked very hard to recruit Albert, who had been uh, head of genetics at the University of Helsinki in, in Finland, Albert de la Chapelle. And to the point you're making, yes, he's one of the people that discovered um, the cause of Lynch syndrome, and perhaps equally importantly, the, the nature of the genes and what was going wrong in Lynch syndrome. So, and that was one of many, many outstanding genetic discoveries Albert made throughout his career another member of the National Academy of Science. And so he was the big push from Dave. And Albert relayed that, you know, he was married to a woman who lived in Buffalo, New York, uh, Clara Bloomfield, who everyone had heard of, of course, uh, but they didn't know that they were married. They'd been married for 13 years, living apart, pursuing their careers and largely spending summers together. And, um, and that this was a time when Albert and Clara decided they really wanted to be together on the same campus working together. And so Clara became part of the recruitment package, uh, much to the good fortune of Ohio State University. And then subsequently, uh, I had also been looking to move on from Roswell Park. And, you know, we just decided that um, it would be the three of us. And so I came along as well. She really wanted me to come with her and uh, wanted it to be very attractive. She saw me, I think, as someone who could be very helpful with building the science, building the clinical medicine. And we were then, by that time, we were working together because then, you know, we were on the forefront of genetics and cancer. Clara was my uh, one and only lifetime professional mentor. And so any skills that I've um, acquired came through her. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Dave offered her the Comprehensive Cancer Center to lead. Uh, Dave would remain CEO of the James. So, um, you know, it all worked out very well. To your point, Claire and I had discussed, well, Michael, I'd like you to come. What I'd like to do is I'm going to run hematology and oncology for a couple of years, and then I'd like to turn it over to you. But what I want you to do is let's get our science and your science, because by then I was a well-funded investigator, and let's get you, you know, on the wards helping me out. Um, You'll be in charge of recruiting again because I was in charge of recruiting at Roswell. And, uh, and then after a couple of years, you take over the division of hematology, oncology. After I do what I think I need to do, I'll just run the cancer center. Albert will run the genetics program. Dave will run the hospital. What was really neat is the four of us um, got along exceedingly well. And any tension that existed between like hematology and oncology and uh, the James it just kind of dissipated. And we just really began to work as a team. And we did that, you know, for the next 20 years. Um, it was just, uh, it just always worked well. Had our disagreements. Um, everybody had their opinions, but in the end, we were aligned. And I think the university saw us as a very aligned group of leaders. And I would attribute a lot of the success we saw in the cancer program over the years, not from me or Albert or Clara or Dave, but rather that symphony, along with our administrative leaders who who uh, joined us, Dennis Smith and Jeff Walker and others as well. So um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a very special time. I was very, very honored to be part of it. That, that's an interesting dynamic you just explained, how the four of you came together to share leadership and, and overcome your disagreements and build something great. Absolutely. That's the way it worked. And we had a good group of external advisors, I was deputy director of the cancer center when Clara was director of the cancer center. So I was intimately involved and 
in the cancer center right from the get-go. And then I became head of hematology and oncology, I think probably in 2000, maybe after two or three years. And, um, and that became, you know, a real driving force for the James because we just built that from about 12 or 14 faculty to 70 faculty, all experts in specific cancers and really, I think, you know, able to, uh, to really create a national presence in, in Columbus for cancer that, that, like I said, was started initially by Dave and, and of course, then Clara. So when you were recruiting people then, which you were in charge of and you and you've told me this before, you went after the best. Yes. What is it that you offered them? What is it that you would say that coming here to Ohio State, to the James and to the Comprehensive Cancer Center would provide them with? Opportunity. You know, I, I would say to everyone, opportunity is inversely proportional to what's in place. If what I did, I wanted to do, remain at the Dana-Farber, which is in Boston, Harvard's Cancer Institute, I could have done it, but it would have been a lot slower and the line would have been a lot longer. They're packed with talent. When you come to a new place or a place that's reorganizing from the ground up, uh, both as Ohio State was doing New James and then a cancer center that was reorganizing, if you're really interested in leading and really testing the hypothesis of can you lead and can you grow quickly, the opportunity is the place that's looking for leaders, not at a place that's stacked with them. So that was always and always has been my sell, and it's always been my interest. You know, I went to Roswell when I was Clara's first recruit. We came to Ohio State when they were in a process of really rebuilding, you know. And I find that to be fun because that's when you can really see what you can do. I mean, if you've got the resources, you really got the opportunity to, to make your mark. And I would say to them at Ohio State, you know, if this doesn't excite you, I'm not interested because if you're not interested in coming here after what I've just told you, then you're not who I'm looking for. You've got to be incredibly excited about this. And so people like Steve Clinton and Greg Otterson and uh, Guido Marcucci and Manisha Shaw, and, uh, many, many others, they just saw it as, you know, this is a great place to go ahead and get started. Okay. That was, that was a really interesting, I never really heard it from that perspective before. Now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Mike, we're going to talk about building one of the, the world's best cancer hospitals in the middle of some tough economic times. A revolution in lung cancer treatment is happening at the James. We're proving lung cancer isn't solely defined by location and stage, but rather the individual molecules and genes that drive it. Simply put, there is no routine lung cancer. That's why our world-renowned specialists put their expertise towards treating one particular lung cancer, yours. At The James, we go beyond the routine to prevent, detect, treat, and cure your lung cancer. To learn more, call 1-800-293-5066. We're back with Mike Calagiri, the former director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center and former CEO of the James. And we're talking about the 30th anniversary of the James. And 30 years ago, the James Cancer Hospital was a much different building than it is today. So Mike, where in the world did you get this idea in the midst of the recession of 07, 08 to build a billion dollar amazing cancer hospital with the science and the clinical medicine we built is the james went from a lower occupancy to full and overflowing and year after year we were biting off more and more of pieces of the medical center to uh, put james cancer patients in non-cancer beds and just came to the realization at a meeting that we need a new hospital I mean, we're we're cooking cancer's growing um we're we have a good financial footing, and um, we think we need to make a statement to the world that we can, um, we can do this. And so there was alignment in the leadership. The trick is, of course, to get the prioritization at the university level um, for you know, building what turns out to be the third largest cancer hospital in America. Mike met with Ohio State President Gordon Gee to discuss his plan. You know, Gordon, 
we're on a roll here and we can do great things for the Columbus community, for the university, for the cancer patient. Uh, we need a new, a new hospital and it's, it's gonna be a big project. And the good news is, you're really not gonna have to pay for it. Yes, it's your money, but we're not gonna need funds from the state. We're not gonna need funds from the endowed, and we're not gonna need, we feel that the way we're doing with our financial footing, uh, we can pay for this. Um, uh, from the, and the bond market is gonna look on us favorably because of how well we've done. And I said, you know, I'm, you know we're, we're aligned, Dave, Clara, Albert, all agree that I should consider for the, the next leader of the James. I'd, I'd like to do that, but I, I want the commitment. And he gave it in writing. Um, I still have the letters, you know, he put it down that we're gonna build a, one of the best and largest cancer hospitals in America, and you know, this is gonna happen. So, and you know, stuck to his word. It was a 10 year plan, essentially. It was, didn't start, you know, I don't know when Gordon came back and when all that happened, but probably started 2006, 2007, 2008 in there. Uh, it turned out to be, as you said, you know, 1.1 million square feet, $1.1 billion, uh, an absolute, you know, monument to Columbus, Ohio State, and, <clears throat> and the world. It's, it's, it's now, you know, an amazing, amazing, beautiful hospital. Uh, that gives such phenomenal care to our cancer patients due to, you know, just, you, you just, you just have to meet the staff of the James and uh, the leaders and, and you know you're in the right place as a patient. You know, it was really interesting. The, the forecast was, you know, it's going to be, um, you know, we built this third largest cancer hospital in America in Columbus, Ohio. So you'd say, wow, it's going to be years until it's filled. And that was the projection. We had it filled in one year. And as you know, a couple of years later, we built, a, I think when I was just leaving Ohio State, we were building out the last two floors. Right. It's, it's filled to capacity. But it's, it, that goes back to what you, you first mentioned about the hospital, that is, as your rep reputation for care grew, you began pulling in patients from further and further away because they knew that this is the best care in Ohio and beyond. Absolutely, and faculty knew this was a great place to start the career because they had seen those people from years earlier come launch their career with the opportunities that existed, and then one begets the other, right? Then you get the next generation and the next generation, and then by that time, we were stacked three, four deep with a specialist in every single type of cancer, just doing one type of cancer. And as we used to say, as still said in Columbus, there's no routine cancer. You got colon cancer, you wanna see somebody that just does colon cancer. That's what the James offers the entire central Ohio community. That's the only place where you get an expert in your particular cancer. And that all started with us when, when, you know, when Dave recruited us in, that was the whole mantra. We're going to super specialization. Another thing I'm sensing is that you can never stand still and rest on your laurels. You've got to keep building, adding, staying state-of-the-art. And I think that's perhaps where Pelotonia came in, that in order to get to that next level, where are we going to get the money, the research money, in a, an atmosphere when the federal funding was sort of uh, slowing down or, or even worse? Yeah. I mean, if you think about what was happening in 2008... <laughs> Was, uh, that was when I became the CEO, not a good year. Uh, worst recession in our history, I think. But, you know, it was interesting. I had been thinking I'm gonna be the, become the CEO and I'm gonna I wanna do something different to raise money than had been done. Phenomenal efforts by different people up on the roof and other events that were, you know, got society to come in and understand the James and what we do there. But I wanted to do something a little more grassroots and had been thinking about a bike event. There had been one in Boston. I wasn't ever part of it. I left Boston before it ever really took off. But I thought, well, you know, Columbus, the area is flat. We don't have a bike event. And um, I started talking to the organizer of the bike event in Boston. And he said, you know, this would be a really good idea to do there because you can really, all the reasons I said, largest university in America, there's no bike event, it's flat, it's decent climate. Um, you know, we got this big university to, you know, participate in this. So, you know, that's in your head. You got this idea. But, you know, you realize that the first time you tell somebody an idea that if they go, well, that's a stupid idea. 
So I kept it to myself because, uh, you know, I wanted to not hear that answer. And so one day, uh, the, the, uh, a very dear friend and, and again, a great colleague and, and uh, someone who's been a great advisor to me, Cindy Hilsheimer, came to me and said, Mike, you know, you're going to be the head of the James. I'm head of the foundation board for the James. Um, you should be thinking about a different kind of fundraising event. What are you going to do to raise money? And I said, Cindy, I've had this idea and I've been afraid to say it to anybody, but I'm going to say it to you because it's kind of a wild idea, but I think it could really work. And I laid out the whole idea about how it would work, how it could pay for itself, how 100% of the money could go to cancer research, how it could be grassroots across the community. And Cindy, who's just an amazing person, looked at me and said, I think I know who will fund this, which is classic Cindy. And I would say within a week, we had the folks from NetJets in our office uh, Danny Rosenthal, Rich Santuli, uh, the phenomenal individuals and their team uh, saying, you know, verbally saying, we'd like to do this. And, and so they funded, they agreed to fund this uh, and, and did so the first year and agreed to subsequent years. There were some changes after that. But, uh, you know, then, then you're talking about all the money goes to cancer research. I mean, it was that easy just having the idea and having, knowing Cindy. And then getting Danny and Rich Santuli on board, and I mean, it was, you know, it, it, it was it was just easy. I, you say it was easy, but I don't know because it's easy in retrospect. Eleven years later, when it's raised more than two hundred million, but weren't there concerns and the f first year that it's not going to catch on? We're not going to get enough riders. We're not going to create the momentum. You know, there were a couple of people that said, yeah, here we are, 2009, so now the economy is sinking, sinking, and sinking, and here we're going to develop what's going to be a world-class, first-class bike event. And you know who, uh, who said, damn it, we're going through with this? Gordon. Oh, uh, Gordon Gee again. Gordon. Because, you know, I went to, after, to talk to Cindy and Danny uh, Rosenthal and, and Rich Santulli all gave the thumbs up, let's, let's talk about how we can fund this. And I, went, you know, I had to go tell Gordon. And because uh, Gordon, again, could have said at that point, no, this is not going to fit with my plan. And of course, Gordon, like you said, he loves big ideas. He said, I really like this idea because it involves everybody. And so, um, you know, that was the last that was the last thing we needed was his blessing. And um, and then as we got closer and closer and we hired our first, uh, you know, leader, Tom Lennox, who we started a 501c3, you know. The, the thing is, you know, you say in retrospect, but really you got Cindy Hillsheimer, who's an amazing business person, NetJets, amazing business people, Gordon. Um, you really got myself and the cancer, as the cancer person, you really got everybody you need around the table to get a business up and running. I mean, Cindy had the pro, pro forma done on the back of an envelope in my office in 15 minutes. And said this, and she said, "I think in the first five years we can raise thirty million dollars." That was the pro forma, and we raised, of course, sixty. So there were no qualms about has this been, and you know, and one hundred percent of the money went to cancer research at James and the Cancer Center at Ohio State, and it brought in a lot of non-cancer people doing cancer research. So it was really, it really was in many, many ways, and still is in many ways. You know, it's something everybody participates in, everybody can get behind. And uh, it's just been a great tribute to the community of uh, Central Ohio and the businesses of Central Ohio and the Ohio State University. Perhaps most important has been the science that's funded. You know, the drug Abrutinib, which is now a worldwide $7 billion drug, uh, which is a, a treatment for one type of leukemia. The first thing ever done with Abrutinib was, uh, was done with $100,000 from Pelotonia. Well, let's transition into another topic. And the every five years, correct me if I'm wrong, the National Cancer Institute gives a grade to all their comprehensive cancer centers. And in, again, correct me if I'm wrong, 2015? Yes. You, the, the, the Ohio State Comprehensive Cancer Center that you led got a perfect score, which is incredibly rare. So how did that come about? Uh, two words, hard work, you know. <laughs> and so we went to work and, you know, we recruited about 
350 physicians, scientists, and physician scientists over the course of that time, at least 350, uh, which is an enormous number of people when you think about their families and their impact in communities and, um, and their, most importantly, their impact and contributions to the cancer effort. And so, you know, Clara led the resurgence. She, she was the first director. There were four cycles while I was there. Clara did the first one and got us kind of out of the lower level and into a, a standard level. It was called excellent. The grades were, you know, very good, which is very bad. Uh, excellent, outstanding, and exceptional. And so she got us to an excellent. And, um, and that was good. She kind of got a safe footing. And she did it for about, she did it from 97 to 2003. And after six years, she said, I'm done with this, Michael, it's your turn. And, uh, you know, I stepped into the role and I had been the, the associate director. And more importantly, I was on the committee that judges cancer centers at the National Cancer Institute. And so I really had a sense for how this really works. And we put together a plan that, you know, over the following three cycles, we would just get better and better and better. And in fact, the next cycle, we went to an outstanding, uh, which is up from exceptional. And five years later, we went to uh, a, 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 I'm sorry, we went to an outstanding, which is up from excellent. And then after that next five years, so my 10th year as the director, we went to uh, exceptional, which is the highest level and had a score of 12 and the perfect score is 10. So it, it goes backwards. Worst score is 100, perfect score is 10, and we got a 12. And so we were pretty damn close uh, at 2010. And, um, you know, and just we just, kept, we just kept doing what we were doing. The strategy didn't change. Just keep recruiting, keep translating, keep building. You get critiques back, so you work on the critiques over the next five years. It's a wonderful system. And, you know, the stars aligned for us. And we were the first university comprehensive cancer center uh, in America to get a perfect score from the National Cancer Institute in the history of the comprehensive cancer centers program. Got a perfect 10 in 2015. And that was really, really uh, a, a remarkable um, achievement for our university, certainly for our cancer program. And I can tell you, you know, now being away from Ohio State um, and the reputation that Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center has amongst cancer center leaders, I can tell you that everyone says the same thing. That's the model. Leadership is, of course, an important part of this. And you've told me before your theory on leadership. So I want you to tell everyone else your theory on leadership, the three fingers of leadership. Yeah. It's hard to envision on a podcast, but if yeah. people would put their hand up their pinky finger, ring finger, and middle finger and delicately with that last middle middle finger, but explain your three fingers of leadership philosophy. Well, that's why I used to tell my kids, and they, you know, I tell them all the time, you know, you'll get success as a leader if you have three things, and they're in this order. Least important, that's your pinky. Very important, that's your ring finger. And most important is your middle finger. And the first is intelligence. That's the least important. Least important. Okay. Highly overrated. Not about how smart you are. No one cares how smart you are. It's about the, the ring finger, how hard you work, and the middle finger, how nice you are. Um, with, with the nice beating out work uh, just by a little bit. It's important to be nice to people, to get along with people, to be a good listener. And as a leader, as I always used to say, and the model was Clara, the one word to describe leadership is selflessness. You are there to give for others. If you're there to put the crown on your head and you think you're going to be the king, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. You know, you've got a lot of responsibilities. You've got to be a good listener and you've got to be selfless in your giving for others. That's what people look for in good leaders. And, um, you know, I think that Clara created a great model for me and I was able to. Uh, take the baton from her and you know we built this largest this uh, third largest cancer hospital in america beautiful emblem for the city of columbus state of ohio the nation and uh perfect score in the core grant it's a good time to say goodbye wow uh you know i was skeptical when you first told me this about niceness being the most important 
aspect of leadership. But over time, I'm, I'm, I think I've come to agree with you. Yeah, I, I thank you for that. Um, you hear that from um, you know successful business leaders. I remember reading about uh, Jack Welch, who passed away recently, and 